Hey guys, welcome back to Supposedly Fun, I'm Greg, and today I thought it would be fun to give a kind of not note of encouragement to these two books, They're There and The Great Believers. These books, as you probably know if you've followed my channel at all, were the finalists for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. They did not win. Uh, so I thought, what better way to give these books some encouragement that they might still become canon than to look at some other books that did not win a Pulitzer Prize. So I've got this big pile right here to talk about. Uh, interestingly enough, I have a long-standing history of being fascinated with the Academy Awards to the fact that, to the extent that I get re really into the nitty-gritty and kind of obsess over it. I didn't realize I was this interested in the Pulitzers until I started making these videos. It's just funny to learn something about yourself that you hadn't really named before. So there you go for whatever that's worth. Now let's dive in. The first one is Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Now, this is a really interesting case because the fiction jury for the 1974 Pulitzer Prize actually did recommend Pynchon's postmodern epic as the novel most deserving of the prize for that year. However, the Pulitzer board had such a viscerally antagonistic reaction that they chose not to give an award that year rather than see it go to Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow, which they described as unreadable, turgid, and overwritten. Nevertheless, Gravity's Rainbow has gone on to become a classic and one of literature's most infamously difficult and uh, in inaccessible titles. I mean, think like James Joyce's Ulysses or uh, Proust's In Search of Lost Time. That is the legacy that Gravity's Rainbow has. Now, uh, two books in a similar situation are Karen Russell's Swamplandia and Dennis Johnson's Train Dreams, which were among the three finalists nominated in 2012 when the Pulitzer board inexplicably decided not to select a winner or failed to select a winner. We don't really know what happened. Uh, the third title was by David Foster Wallace, whom I have never read, despite the fact that the name of this YouTube channel right here is a nod to one of his books. Uh, but in my mind, it really came down to Russell and Johnson and this sweet, slim little volume he wrote. Uh, in, my, in my mind, I would give the edge to Dennis Johnson. Um, this is a really effective novella about a day laborer. You really can't go wrong with either one of these titles, though. They're both very good. Then there's The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, which uh, you may remember from my all-time favorite books. Now, this book ha has had classic status for a very long time, so it's difficult to remember just how controversial it was when it was released. In fact, between 1961 and 1982, I believe, it was the most censored title in the high schools and libraries across the United, United States. And that reputation continues. It is frequently among the top 10 most challenged books. Why? Because its main character, Holden Caulfield, is a teenager who very much questions society and moral codes, and he also smokes and drinks and uses vulgar language and thinks about sex. Because, you know, teenagers don't do that, right? Come on. And then there's James Baldwin. Now, technically, James Baldwin moved to Paris before he wrote most of his major works. So technically, you could argue that he's ineligible for a Pulitzer because a Pulitzer is supposed to go to an American author. Now, he is American, but, but because of that dubious citizenship, you could make a case that he is ineligible. However, all of his writing is, I would argue, quintessentially American, and really, I mean, he has so many books that you could award. There's Go Tell It on the Mountain, Giovanni's Room, uh, The Fire Next Time, If Beale Street Could Talk, I could go on. Uh, the truth is, he was an uncompromising social and political activist who never shied away from necessary criticism, even if the, it, that would make the mainstream uncomfortable. So it's really no surprise that he failed to win a Pulitzer, but it is also shameful. Then there is Joan, Joan Didion. Now, name a book that Joan Didion has written. She deserved to win a Pulitzer for it. Uh, she was a finalist for this one. With, uh, this one was a finalist for the Biography Pulitzer Prize in 2006. It did not win. I think it was robbed. But there's also Slouching Toward Bethlehem. There's the White Album. There's her, not, not her novel, Played As It Lays. To me, it is shocking that Joan Didion does not have a Pulitzer Prize. And then, Plague of Doves is another book that was a finalist, this one for Louise Erdrich. It lost to Olive Kitteridge, and I, with apologies to Elizabeth Strout fans, this one really deserved it. 
Now, I could have just as easily put Louise Erdrich down for... Oh, I'm out of order here. Love Medicine, which is another book of hers that is kind of a modern classic. But to me, I, I haven't read it yet, so it's kind of hard for me to get behind it. Instead of Plague of Doves, which is something I have read and really, really love. It's a profound look at historical injustice and the ways in which an unsolved crime ripple through a reservation uh, in North Dakota through generations. It's very good. If you haven't read it, check out Plague of Doves. Now let's talk about Death Comes for the Archbishop by Willa Cather. Now, her, some of her most famous works, like O Pioneers and My Encinia, were published before the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Therefore, obviously, they would not have been able to win. However, Death Comes for the Archbishop was published in 1927, which means it could have been a great chance to award her for one of her most famous, well-regarded, and popular works. However, Willa Cather had won a Pulitzer four years earlier for one of her lesser-known titles, which was um, one of ours. It's kind of like she won a Career Achievement Award a little too early. This is the one that would have made much more sense. And then, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is perhaps the novel that is most frequently cited as the great American novel. And since one of the criteria of the Pulitzer Prize is to reward a title that deals with American life, it seems like this is a really glaring omission. Um, at least that's how we think of this book today. Back when it was published in 1925, Gatsby received mixed reviews and sold poorly. It was uh, after F. Scott Fitzgerald died that it earned recognition. Uh, it became popular during World War II. And from there, it made it onto high school curriculums and then became as well regarded as we recognize it to be today. And let's talk about Raymond Carver. Now, Raymond Carver was nominated. He was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize um, for his short story collection, Cathedral, which was published in 1984, but it didn't win. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, the Pulitzer Board had a second chance to award him when stories from Cathedral and some of his other major works were compiled into this, where I'm calling from New and Selected Stories. And to me, this is one of the most tremendous works of short stories that exists. It, there is a precedent for the Pulitzer Board awarding compilations. Hello, John Cheever. And this is an all-time great. Unfortunately, it did not work out with Raymond Carver and the Pulitzer Prize. So then we have Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, which I could have sworn I have a copy of, but it's not on my bookshelf, and that concerns me. Anyway, uh, Vonnegut was probably seen as too weird for the Pulitzer, or for the Nobel, for that matter. Uh, and his work was often labeled as science fiction, which made ensures that it really had to deal with that stigma that comes along with genre fiction. Um, Slaughterhouse-Five, his classic novel about the bombing of Dresden during World War II, is probably his most accessible work, and therefore the one that would have his best shot at winning an award. However, it didn't happen. Then we have Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. Comedic novels are a hard sell for awards. Given the fact that comedic novels have a hard time, it's probably not surprising that one of the all-time great satirical novels failed to make a splash in its time. However, it is recognized as one of the most significant novels of the 20th century nowadays. But at the time, it was kind of love it or hate it. The New Yorker's review said that it doesn't even seem to be written. Instead, it gives the impression of having been shouted onto paper. So... We know, we, we, know, we know differently now, although I do will say a lot of people who do read this in a modern context uh, still feel the same way. Then we have The Things They Carry by Tim O'Brien. Now, unlike Catch-22, this classic collection of stories centered around the Vietnam War was appreciated in its time. And it, indeed, it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 1991. It lost to John Updike, who won for the second time for uh, one of his series in the Rabbit... Uh, <laughs> Harry Rabbit Angstrom titles, uh, and that was the second book in that series to win a Pulitzer Prize. How do I feel about that? I'm just rolling my eyes, so, you know, that's how I feel about that. Then we have Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I have an Amer advanced copy of this. That is what the cover of the hardcover actually looked like. Now, I'm not quite sure of Adichie's eligibility status. It's supposed to go to an American author. She was born in Nigeria, and she divides her time between Nigeria and the United States these days. However, this sterling novel about a young Nigerian woman who immigrates to the United States to go to college is essential reading for the modern world. So it's a shame that it didn't get recognized by the Pulitzer. Then we have another one of the all-time great short story collections. 
A Manual for Cleaning Women by Lucia Berlin. Now, Berlin died in 2004, which was 11 years before this compilation was, was published and earned her the very well-deserved recognition that had eluded her during her entire life and career. Uh, the Pulitzers do consider posthumous works that aren't compilations of letters or diaries, uh, and it has happened. A Confederacy of Dunces won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction 11 years after its author, John Kennedy Toole, committed suicide. So there's a precedent, however, it's not exactly common. Still, this absolutely wonderful collection of short stories would have been a much better choice, in my mind, than the book that did win that year, which was The Sympathizer by Viet Tan Nguyen. Now, we have Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, like several books on this list, Their Eyes Were Watching God was not particularly well received in its time, uh, even among African American critics who, who discussed it. Its depiction of sensuality in particular seems to have been a mark against it. Uh, we now uh, don't worry about that as much. It's still kind of an issue. But in the years since, it has come to be regarded as a classic and as a mainstay of school curriculums. Then we have The Good Lord Bird. I mostly want to include this book in the list because I think it would have been a much, 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 much better choice uh, for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction than the book that did win the year it was released, which was The Goldfinch. Um, I love this book. I've recommended this book many times, and I DNF'd The Goldfinch, so you can imagine how I feel about that situation. Uh, then we have A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. I've never read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. However, it has been recommended to me many times and I really do want to get to it someday. It's about a girl who grows up in Williamsburg in the first two decades of the 20th century. It deals with poverty and tenacity. And unlike a few of the other books on the list, it was also a wild success when it was published. Uh, but Pulitzer Glory still eluded it. Journey in the Dark by Martin Flavin was in the one instead. That is a book that I had never heard of <laughs> until I looked up the book that did win that year instead. So there you go. And then we have a bit of a long story coming, but I think it's really interesting. There's The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullers. Now this is another literary sensation from the year it was published that still managed to miss the big prize. And another book that is consistently recommended to me and which I still have not managed to to read, so for shame to me. The worst part is no award was given for fiction that year at the Pulitzer Prizes. So what gives Pulitzer Board? Well, what gives is that the jury recommended that two finalists win for the, win the prize that year, and they recommended that the two books tie. Those books are Conrad Richter's now unknown book, The Trees, and Walter Van Tilburg Clark's The Oxbow Incident. Now, Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls had been considered a heavy frontrunner for the Pulitzer Prize that year, and the Pulitzer jury did list that book among several other titles on the list that it submitted to the jury. Those titles were not finalists, they just happened to be, uh, they just included other books that could be considered. However, on that list, they did not have very nice things to say about For Whom the Bell Tolls. When the Pulitzer board convened to discuss what was going to win, they completely disregarded the finalists that the jury had selected and demanded that For Whom the Bell Tolls win instead. Further complicating matters, the president of Columbia University, which administers the prize and therefore has a say in what the board does, found the book, quote, offensive and lascivious and uh, did not think at all that it was a book that should be associated with both the Pulitzer Prize and Columbia University and essentially caused a stalemate in discussions about the prize for that year. What happened is that the Pulitzer board decided not to give the award at all, since they couldn't give it to For Whom the Bell Tolls, uh, because they felt that giving it to any other book would be giving it to an inferior prize. Uh, the same thing happened to, I believe, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, but don't quote me on that because I haven't actually looked it up. Um, Hemingway did eventually win a Pulitzer Prize, but in 1963, 12 years later, for The Old Man in the Sea. Uh, as for Carson McCullers, she remained Pulitzerless, sadly. So, there you go, fun little story for you. I hope, or at least I hope that you thought that was a fun little story. Those are some great books that did not win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction or for nonfiction. Are there any books that you think would be glaring omissions? Or are there any of these that you think I'm crazy for thinking should have won a Pulitzer? I'd love to hear that. Anyway, thank you for your time. In watching this video. If you liked it, I hope you uh, would hit subscribe or watch some of my other videos. If you're already subscribed, thank you for that. I really appreciate your time. I'll be back again, and until then, happy reading, everybody.